this uh, series is to one celebrate two visionaries Professor Elias Suleiman Bogoro, the current Executive Secretary of TEDFON, Nigeria, a distinguished global professor of animal science, and also to celebrate an Harvard graduate and a leader of leaders, Dr. David Kwabena Wilson, the president of Morgan State University. Most of us here are beneficiaries of these visionary leaders' ideas that was consummated and we are executing since 2020. To date, we have over a hundred people, scholars, intellectuals being trained by the national treasure of the state of Maryland, that is Morgan State University. The vision here is to mentor, to learn, to share knowledge, and to create opportunities for publishing your intellectual properties, that is your research, without necessarily costing you anything, particularly for those of us on the other side of the Atlantic. We've been listening to two intellectuals who promise to share with us their knowledge, their research, and I will introduce them shortly. Let me also state that our purpose for this important forum is to provide platform for transdisciplinary discourse it is a forum that is not just for the postdoc being sponsored by tedfon or the doctoral students being sponsored by tedfon as you can see we are fully booked till the end of june and our four schedule is also building up it is for all of us so whether you are a tech one or you are not, or you are a faculty, or you are a teacher, you are, as long as you would like to share with us your intellectual property, we are open. So you just reach out to, to us. You can email me, you can reach out to a friend and then send in your topic or the title of your paper. I should also stress that within the context of the 10-year strategic uh, plan for Morgan State University transition from research, Carnegie Research 2 to Carnegie Research 1 is to fulfill goal 3, which is to elevate Morgan status to R1, very high doctoral research university. We have consistently maintained R2, and with this platform and the eventual publications, we will be adding value to that quest for R1, and perhaps we will be the first of the historically black colleges and universities. It is also to be a hard I mean, to hard advantage or add value rather, to go cease of that strategic plan, which is accelerate global education initiatives and expand the university's international footprint. The Office of Global Partnerships, Africa, and indeed the strategic plan of Morgan State University with its 154 years experience is to create that global context and Africa is the centerpiece of such you know uh, conceptualization so the brown bag is a bi-weekly opportunity and you do not have to 
wait in the waiting room except that if you violate the rules of engagement which is you come in you mute yourself you do not distract us then you will not be put in the other room because i don't want to meet you in the other room you'll be alone what are the rules i've mentioned that before we started recording and i will re-emphasize that please do not unmute yourself please the presenters will have 30 minutes the first presentation will be by dr Otumu Adetokumbo McGregor. I will introduce him properly shortly. Uh, we'll have uh, comments and some few questions. And then afterwards, we will listen to Dr. Elijah Ikano, who will also speak and ask some questions. So we do not expect us to be more than two hours here. So we appreciate on behalf of my immediate boss, Dr. Astake, Professor of Electrical Electronics Engineering. I welcome all of you. Yeah. See, uh, okay, he, he has just joined us. Yes, yes, of course. The chief of staff has also joined us. He's also the vice president for state and uh, federal government partnerships and the chief of staff to the president. We are so honored. And I will yield at this point because they are supposed to be in another meeting. They just spare, you know, a few minutes with us. And I think, uh, I don't know in which order, but I think uh, Dr. Ville is representing the yes, president. Sir. So he will go, he will go last. Uh, Dr. Astake, you are the floor, sir. Yes, yes. Uh, Dr. Ville, thank you for joining us. Uh, on behalf of the president's office, colleagues, I'm excited to uh, uh, participate in this uh, forum i see more than 100 participants which is amazing uh and i want to say on behalf of the division of international affairs i will welcome all of you uh from nigeria also but from the u.s faculty uh, postdocs phd students this is an amazing comeback series and i want to for putting this together uh like you indicated uh, i have to attend the dean's council meeting and it just happened that today we have a two-hour meeting so I will be stepping in and out of this meeting that is getting recorded so that I can listen to the uh, rich that is going to happen. But the only piece I want to add is, as you all look at our 10 year strategic plan, Africa is front and center. And that's why we have uh, an office of OGP Africa. And by working together, we will make sure that Morgan's connection to Africa will be a long lasting one. And we hope that by with your support and your collaboration, uh, those of you who are especially doing your PhD at Morgan, those of you who are doing your postdoc at Morgan, when you research to Nigeria, you're returning with a long lasting connection and partnership so that we build on this uh, five to 10 years and be able to have even a stronger partnership between Morgan and also um, uh, African countries. Of course, the lead partner in Africa right now is Nigeria, and so we want to welcome all of you. I want to say thank you, Dr. Tijani, for putting such an amazing event together. And now I want to pass the baton to my colleague, uh, Dr. Ville, to say a few uh, words, of uh, uh, remarks, say hello on behalf of the President's office. But to all of you, uh, I'm so sorry I cannot stay for the whole thing, but I'll be in and out. I wish you the best, and I uh, wish you an excellent semester. And thank you for joining us. Uh, Dr. Ville, please go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Stocky, uh, Dr. Tujani. We certainly appreciate this phenomenal opportunity that you're presenting um, to this group of phenomenal individuals, as well as to uh, us here in the president's office and, and throughout the Morgan community. Thank you for that. Uh, it's efforts like this that make a difference for, for our institution and particularly for you all, because we are now one, if you will, as we continue to march in the direction of progress together here. Um, Dr. Ostaki talked about our strategic plan. And you, you let us know. Um, this is something something exciting that we, that, that we're very excited about. In this case, it's goal six with expanding our global footprint. And, and the relationship and partnership that we have in place with, with you all is something that our president 
is immensely excited about. He's been talking this type of language, if you will, the, the, the fact that it's, it's a partnership like this that would matter in the world for many, many, many years. And I'm just glad that I'm a participant and up close, uh, close enough to see that it has come to fruition. Dr. Wilson is excited about this. We all are excited about this partnership uh, at Morgan. And by all means, if we can be of any assistance to you as you continue to hear us, hear from us, do not hesitate. Uh, reach out to us. You, know, you are one with our institution. Uh, we recognize that um, that along the way, there will be things that you would like to see that that's not in place or perhaps things that um, you would recommend that can strengthen our relationship. We're open for those types of considerations as well. You have great leadership in front of you with Dr. Tijani, Dr. Ostaki, and we, we're excited about that. We have lots of confidence in their skill sets and their ability to make this relationship work. So thank you again. And uh, periodically I will be in and out as well, but I'm so excited that you're here and. Um, and what a op great opportunity for our institution today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Bill. Thank you very much, Dr. Astake. Let me quickly uh, acknowledge one of the uh, supporters of uh, of this uh, relationship, since you mentioned Telephone and the Morgan State, uh, the back end people is a Dr. Alada, the chairman of AD4 TV Radio. And uh, right now, this is being broadcasted in Nigeria and globally, West Africa, and uh, other parts of the world that, you know, the, uh, the TV and the radio is reaching. Uh, Dr. Jacob Alada, we thank you for joining us. He actually joined about two hours ago, uh, you know, because of the time zone. I would like to also appreciate my colleagues, uh, professors from different, I think I saw Professor Bista, uh, Professor Peng, and a whole lot of them. I really appreciate you for finding the time to, to, to join us. Uh, without wasting much time, I have set the rules and the two presenters are ready. I said the presenters will have 30 minutes. The first to go will be Dr. Ade Tokumbo McGregor John Utumu. He is a lecturer from the Department of Information Technology, Federal University of Technology, Oweri, Nigeria. He is currently a postdoctoral research fellow uh, with us at Morgan. His interest of research is artificial intelligence under the, uh, the subfields of machine learning, deep learning, and natural language processing. He has over 50 research papers published in international journals and conferences to his credit. At this point, Dr. Otomo, you have the virtual floor to speak for 30 minutes, and uh, we are here to learn. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Good morning, all. I'm just going to sh quickly share my screen. Okay, I guess you can all see my screen. Yes, we sure can. All right, thank you. I guess it's afternoon in Nigeria. Good afternoon, everyone in Nigeria and those in the US and Canada. Good morning. Okay. My name is Dr. McGregor John Otumu. I'm into internet computing. Okay, I'm here to share my research activities here in Morgan, um, which is titled Application of Cognitive Computing for Solving Specific Domain Problems. Okay, this is a quick outline concept of cognitive computing. The three specific areas we're here to discuss here under consideration. We're going to be looking at cybersecurity, medical diagnosis, and online social media networks. I'm going to draw a conclusion and finally quickly run an appreciation. Now, the concept of cognitive computing. According to Kelly and John 2015, cognitive computing can be defined as a technology implant platforms 
that are based on artificial intelligence and signal processing. Um, it's kind of amazing that this platform actually incorporates machine learning, deep learning, face-based reasoning, natural language processing, speech recognition, computer vision, human computer interaction, soft computing, and others. Among others, technology. Now, these are the specific domain. I'm here to um, give my thoughts, my view this morning. The first one is on cybersecurity, while well, the second one is on uh, medical diagnosis. Well, finally, we'll be looking at social media networks. Okay, I'm actually aware that this platform we have a um, transdisciplinary or multidisciplinary audience. I'm going to try real hard to mystify certain concepts so that we can all flow accordingly. Now, this is the first domain, cybersecurity. I'm here to share what I've been doing on cybersecurity, titled an efficient phishing website detection plugin services for existing web browser using random forest classifier. Now, the internet is a hostile environment in which cyber attacks can easily be launched. There are actually different forms of cybersecurity attacks like the malware, which is a malicious software, such as spyware, ransomware, viruses, worm, etc. You also have attacks like denial of service, rebooted denial of service attack, man in the middle attack, SQL code injection, cross site scripting, password attacks, then phishing attack. This is one of the most technique used by Nigerian fosters. Again, also be referred to as 419. So we're going to be working, um, relating my thought pattern of phishing attack. Phishing is a technique used to steal private information for individuals, organizations, yes. by impersonating a reliable source, e.g. a website, which is usually for financial gains. Phishing attack is a social engineering concept to gain access to information in order to defraud victims. Now, this is a diagrammatic flow of the phishing attack concept. We can actually um, liken this phishing attack in terms of computing as that of a fisherman trying to get a fish from the sea using the hook, that one act as a bait. Now, the fisher creates a phishing website by resembling a legitimate website. It moves to the fisher sends a link of phishing website to victim users, down to victim users assess the phishing website and enters their real user's credential. The fisher gets the victim user credentials and the fisher access the legitimate website by using the victim's credentials. Uh, let me just quickly demystify these things. We are looking at sometimes um, you might have a bank. Let me use um, an imaginary bank like XYZ Bank that is that is currently existing. Probably they've been into functionality um, for a long time, and a phishing a phishing attack can occur on such bank by creating an illegitimate website on that same bank, whereby it launches the 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 website that looks exactly, has the same feel, the same aesthetics as that same bank. And users are trying to do internet banking and all that to enter their credentials, like username and password, believing that it's a real website. At the end of the day, the true fisher will pick up their identities and log in into the legitimate website and get them before they. Now, problem statement. Web browser security indicators has some limitations in detecting phishing websites based on their model, user interface, and user experience design. Many users are unable to distinguish between a padlock icon in the browser and an icon associated with the URL that is variously displayed as a web as a browser address bar or next to the site name in a bookmark list. Phishing scams for not yet true phishing website can sometimes be easily deterred by observing whether a URL belongs to a phishing or a legitimate website. 
but users do not pay attention to the URL of this website. Now, expecting users to observe and determine whether a URL is phishing or legitimate is actually unrealistic, inefficient, and inaccurate. Aim and objective of this domain study. The primary aim of this study is to develop an efficient phishing website detection plug-in service. Consider that word or words underlined in red, plug-in service for existing web browsers using random forest classifier, which is actually a machine learning technique. Now, when we're talking about plug-in, we are looking at designing a a, a, a kind of a, a system or a model that will be attached to any existing browser, anyone. We, we just integrate it into the browser and it, and it begins to perform its function. Now, the specific objectives of this study are, one, to develop a model that will extract website characteristics that will be used in classifying websites as either phishing or legitimate. Secondly, to further classify the level of security of severity of the phishing websites detected as either high, moderate, or low threat. Here are some of the related works we actually look considered. We consider the authors, the year, the technique they use, the model security, sorry, the model accuracy, and of course findings and comments. These are also some of the literature we reviewed. Now, I'll move straight to the methodology because of time. Um, method of data collection, online repository. We actually got some um, data sets from a fishing tank, which, con which contains about 11,000 data points with 30 features downloaded from a fishing tank. And these are the features like IP address, URL length, ad symbol, shorting service, request, URL, iframe, and all that. It also, uh, it's also kind of interesting to know that some of the uh, phishing models have been designed before now um, consider less of these features, and this makes them more vulnerable. Figure two here shows the standard phishing architecture, while figure three shows our proposed architecture. There you have the user, the computer, the browser, and I look at the ML, machine learning plugin, and of course our machine learning model. You can actually look at the flow, how the user can actually um, get something from the web browser, feeds it into the web browser, it moves to the internet, and how our model begins to interact with the user. We will see that one in our results. Here, we actually try to model the internal mechanism of the model we design. We can look at the internal interaction between the user and our ML model as designed. From the user to the browser to the ML plugin, which is machine learning plugin, down to our machine learning model. Each of these are like a, an entity that shows the interaction with one another issues with existing system. Here, from based on our findings, we'll see that um, the existing system has some issues which we're actually trying to um, fix. Most of the phishing websites detection model do not achieve high accuracy. Secondly, most of the phishing website uh, detection model do not have unique ability to predict the level of, of severity of the phishing website. Most of the existing detection model takes in no lot of time to train. And most of the phishing detection model depends on few data sets and few data points. Okay? Uh, which can also refer to as heuristics or features for their classification. Now we actually use the random forest classifier, which is the machine learning algorithm. Um basically we Basically, we considered um, some few machine learning algorithms like support vector machine, naive bias, decision tree. We actually trained these four models, the SVM, naive bias, and decision tree alongside with random forest um, classifier. 
it's kind of amazing that um, Random Forest actually show a very high level of accuracy and F1 score. Hence, we decided to flow along with Random Forest classifier, as it were. Experimental setup, data set preparation, and data processing. Data um, preparation refers to a set of procedures that makes a data set more suitable for machine learning. And, and under data pre-processing, we had to carefully observe the data set in order to remove noise such as um, empty fields, wrong entries, etc. Um, we, should, we should note right here and now that um, most of the time spent in the machine learning project is actually spent on um, data preparation and data pre-processing. Okay. Now, at first, the data set was divided into 70% for training and 30% for testing. Now, we discovered that we had some form of um, um, overfitting, okay, based on the machine um, model we developed was kind of, kind of unable to actually um, predict uh, new entries as it were. Now, to reduce this concept of overfitting, we had to like increase our test it, we reduce our test data to 10% and we increase our training data set to 90%. Um, programming language is used from the web platform. We use um, Python programming language for training and building a machine learning model. We use the JavaScript also for the client side functionalities, the HTML for CSS for the user's interface design, and of course, the minimum requirements, we have a uh, Intel 2.5 gigahertz for i3 processor or higher, minimum of two gig RAM, Ethernet wireless card, 250 gig hard drive, and of course a USB port for, for installation and, uh, and and use. Now here we'll discuss some of our results. If you can see the efficient page detector, that is the, that is our plugin service. We, we actually integrated to um, Google Chrome Okay, we use Google Chrome as our test bed environment. We integrated this model into Google Chrome, like you can see for this on the on this, this figure here. If you can see clearly, we we'll actually run um, Google.com on the Chrome browser, and our model is showing it as no threats detected. Okay, mm -hmm. but when we run um, SkillHub, it's showing. Um, there's a threat detected, but the level of severity is low. Again, the model, the, the plugin can also show the level of accuracy of each site visited, showing the precision, the recall, the accuracy, and F1 score value at real time. Now, we also try to do some form of evaluation between our model design and existing research work based on accuracy. We considered about six, seven research work, and we're now to compare it with our model design. From the graph here on the left hand side, you can see the accuracy. Okay, as shows on le so a higher level of accuracy. Again, on the right hand side, we also try to perform another level of evaluation on existing browsers like Google Chrome, Mozilla Firefox, Microsoft Edge, Flock um, browser. Okay, in terms of um, well-known phishing websites, okay, we run well-known phishing websites on these four web browsers. Again, our model, which we integrated into Google Chrome, has a high level of detection rates. Conclusion or recommendation. In conclusion, this enhanced phishing website plugin service acts was developed for existing web browsers as presented. It can efficiently monitor live phishing website traffic based on the added features for the proposed detective mechanism using random forest machine learning classifier. It can perform both binary um, classification as either fishy or legitimate website and can also perform a multi-class classification of the phishing threat as either high, medium, or low threat. In future, 
The proposed framework can further be enhanced for inclusion of more security features and fishing adaptive properties. This can be reasonably applied to other web browsers, indicating real-world phishing situations using advanced algorithms such as deep learning techniques. Now, it's kind of amazing to let you know that this work has been published in American Journal of Artificial Intelligence, as you can see from the certificate of publication. Now, we'll quickly move over to the second domain. Okay, this is the second domain on medical diagnosis and topic for this is a convolutional neural network based model for detection of Asa fever virus using patient blood smear digital image sample introduction. The Lassa fever is actually caused by Lassa virus. In 1969, the Lassa virus was first detected in Nigeria. The Lassa virus started spreading in the 1970s, causing acute illness, which affects a wide range of Nigerian citizens living in Jos, Nigeria. The virus is an arena virus that affects more than 200,000 persons per year based on estimates done through the 1970s as referenced in 14. Spread of the Lassa fever virus. Across several West African countries, such as Liberia, Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Nigeria, natural hosts for Lassa virus. A sought for multimamid rat found around the West African region, that is the rat with um, multiple breasts. Okay. The mode of transmission. Humans contact with infected excreta or rat, such as um, leaving your foodstuffs open, and rats can actually go on top of it, probably excrete or we on it, infected rats. Then also from person to person, um, when they come in contact with the secretion of an infected person, such as saliva. Now figure one actually shows the multimamid rats. Then you have, these are the symptoms. We have both the mild symptoms and the severe symptoms. The mild symptoms are malaise, which is a general feeling of discomfort. You have sore throat, you have cough, you have diarrhea, you have nausea, which is a feeling of sickness, which is an inclination to vomit. And of course, the severe symptoms are satisfied. In some patients are distress respiratory problems, like having difficulty in breathing, as synonymous to COVID-19. You have the deafness of the ear. And of course, you also have the edema, which is swelling caused by excessive flu trapped in the body's tissue. Different laboratory diagnostic approach. Before now, we have the, the medical laboratory diagnostic approach like the enzyme-linked immuno immunosorbent serologic X-ray, which is called um, ELISIA, to detect IgM and Ig. H antibodies as well as Lassa antigens. Also, we also have the reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction. These machines are actually expensive. This PCR is what they actually use also for COVID-19 tests for this their molecular lab. Now, source of sample and data for the viral culture testing. They use the blood sample. They also use it. Um, Food swap or no swap, use the urine, you hold, you also use the cerebral spinal fluid. Challenges in the lab diagnostic approach. Some of the basic or the initial challenges we have with the despite its um, accuracy and despite its um, effectiveness of this lab diagnostic approach, we also have their own shortcomings, like they are very expensive equipment. It also takes a highly skilled professional to operate the machine. And of course, the results comes out. Uh, it doesn't come out uh, quickly. It takes some time for the results to come out. To come out. Okay. Here are some related work that was done, considering the authors here, the domain, the method used, and of course our findings for comments. Okay. Basically, these are authors that um, AI uh, researchers actually try to design a diagnostic um, expert system to detect Lassa fever, as it were. 
based on the shortcomings of the laboratory um, equipment. The first one was done in 2019. They designed a framework for diagnosing Lassa fever based on observed symptoms using a neurocusic based-based reasoner. Now, they actually use 29 symptoms, okay? And it should be noted here that symptoms alone, how the patient feels is not enough to run a test on, um, to just um, conclude based on their research work. 2007, Abiyar and others also did another work on um, Lassa fever. They also did an expert system using a rule-based approach, which is just like an if and then statement. Now, rule-based approach is they are very rigid kind of approach, and they are will be very slow as their rules increase it. And it's also kind of amazing that they also use symptoms. Down from the first to the seventh related works on an AI to diagnose Lassa fever. They use different pop, um, techniques like neurofuse, role base, fuzzy, and all that. All of them considered um, they use symptoms. Just symptoms as their input source. And this, I can say it here and now that symptoms are not just good enough. You have to use things like blood to test to actually know if the patient actually have Lassa fever or not. Now, here, kind of, we're going to explain on that methodology what we did here. Data sets we have over like 18,000 plus <laughs> digital. <laughs> Have been classified as either infected or normal. The, the data collection process was primarily obtained from an online research community. Here yeah, we did a data pre processing, which is a thorough assessment of the data set. Okay, we we'll try to remove some of the um, noise from the data set. Okay, from 18,000, we now fed back to 15,679 after removing the noise, and finally. We use the 15,779 for our work, our proposed model. 70% of this mod of this um, data set we use in training our model, while we use 30% for testing or evaluating our proposed model. One figure two here shows the, the, the digital image sample of the blood um, images. Um, our model. Like I said before now, we actually considered um, convolutional neural network, okay, which is actually a variant of artificial neural network. If you look at figure three, you will see the, the diagram of artificial neural network that has an input layer, a hidden layer, and an output layer. The data set will fade in into the input layer, and the hidden layer will process the the, the whole information and of course it will project it to the output layer now it is amazing to know that the artificial neural network actually tries to mimic the biological neurons that you can see in figure four okay that has the inputs it has the hidden and also the output now it uses um different functions like the dendrites the the asium the soma and others the dendrites, these are like branch-like structures that receive messages from one neuron and allow the transmission of messages to the cell body. Now, the cell body, each neuron has a cell body that has a nucleus, like you can see from the four, okay? And then the asium is, actu is actually like a tube-like structure that carries electrical impulse from the cell body to the asium terminal that passes the impulse to another neuron. And of course, you have the synapse, which is the chemical junction between the termina of one neuron and the dendrites of another neuron. So you see how the Asian neural network, its functionalities actually uh, mimicking that of the biological neurons. But the convolutional neural network we use is actually a variant of artificial neural network, which we'll consider shortly. Now, this is the diagram of the convolutional neural network, okay? The inputs, the hidden, and of course, the output layer. Okay, here, a whole lot of convolution is being taken place. You can have like um, two to 40 or 50 convolutions. Now, the the digital images uh, could be in form of black or white, or it could come out in the form of um, color. 
put it in the ROGB, and that can be considered like a three by three matrix. Okay. Now, what happened behind the scene? Um, I can't begin to explain all that mathematical functionalities right here, but I'll try to demystify as much as I can. Okay. Now the images have been fed in into the input layer. From the input layer, it moves into the hidden layer. Now, the for example, this bed, like you can see, has edges. Okay. The first convolution might consider the edge, forms it into from form of a matrix, three by three matrix, and it will, it will actually solves that, identifies that. Then you can pick on the eye, you can pick on the beak, you can pick on the feathers individually, and all that before you cannot perform the final classification on the output layer. Okay, that's how you're going to train the model. Now, if for example you feed in something like a roach or a tortoise into the input layer, that the picture or the digital image of a tortoise, okay, for it, for the machine to be able to detect if it's a tortoise. Okay. Now, from what I've been trained, from what the model I've been trained upon, if tortoise is not part of it, there's no way the the output layer can actually consider it as a tortoise. Okay. Now. We'll move straight to uh, the own model we designed. This is their proposed ba uh, CNN based model for Lassa fever detection. And from the input layer, you see the blood samples, okay, can be fed oh, into the, the, the input. The blood samples are being fed into the input layer. From there, it moves to the um, hidden layer, and several convolutions can take place. In terms of trying to identify the if that blood sample has um, Lassa virus or not, at the end of the day, you have a binary classification that has zero or one. If it's zero, it shows it doesn't have, and if it's one, it shows it has. Now, this is the experimental setup. This work was actually simulated using Ubuntu 18.04 operating Linux operating system, considering for i5. Um, Processor we use um, RAM 16 gig, 500 gig at the state, uh, space. We use um, Linux, sorry, Python programming language. Then we consider two major libraries: the, the Keras and the TensorFlow. Like I said before, now 70% data set was used for training. Okay, which gives us about 10,900 and some five blood um, Schmel digital image samples. That has um, over like 32 batches. Okay. Sorry, you have, you have two minutes. Then this is part of our results and discussion. We have this uh, training output. Okay. Then this is part of the diagram we have. We have for the plots of the losses and the plots of the accuracy. Okay. Then this is a performance model. In our model, we actually have like 40%. Sorry, uh, 94 percent accuracy. We actually try to compare our model with other existing work like we saw before. Okay, our proposed model seems to have higher level of accuracy as compared to others. In conclusion, in conclusion, we have been able to develop a more effective and efficient model using convolutional neural network for a cell fever diagnosis. We obtain a binary classification that can show the presence of Lassa fever virus. By indicating a zero for infected cases and a one for clean cases. In future, we are looking at integrating this proposed CNN based model into a mobile to web based application for cheap, easy, and a more effective diagnosis. It's also interesting to know that this work has actually been forwarded to a 2022 IEEE Nigeria fourth international conference on disruptive technologies for sustainable development. And finally, this is the big one. This is the current research we are on right now on social just, media. Just summa, summarize, summarize. Yeah, I'm trying to summarize this right now, is which is the development of a sentiment classifier for detecting inverted compliments on a social media textual information. Now, some time ago, it is interesting to note that um, the Twitter was actually shut down in Nigeria based on hate speech. Now. We are trying to find out how do you actually consider what is hate or not hate. If I say Professor Tijani is actually a bad guy in presentation, does it mean that it is actually a hate speech? 
Now, if you put it into a hate speech classifier, it will show that it is actually a hate speech. But in that particular context, it is not hate speech. It means that Professor Tijani is a good guy at presentation. Okay? Sometimes these words can actually be added with so many A's, like bad. Professor Tijani is a bad guy at, present, at uh, online presentation. Now, the Twitter and Nigeria were actually shut down because of this form of um, um, conversation. Okay? Now, it is difficult to know what is hate and not hate. Now, this concept has to actually go through a sentiment analysis for further review. And that is why we're trying to do this work now. The first preliminary stage is we actually try to do a methodical review on AI-based technique on social media network. I'm just going to run all this. I'll just move straight to our findings. Please do. You, your time is up. <laughs> Okay, I'm moving straight to the findings and discussion. Now, based on our findings here, we are looking at um, AI-based methods. Um, deep learning techniques has actually showing a higher level in terms of um, the technique to be used. The data sources, okay, we discover that uh, movie reviews are 16%, Twitter and Kaggle have 16%. So these are um, the sources you can easily get um, your data sets from. In terms of programming languages, two major programming languages were considered Java and Python. Python language actually outperform Java to a very large extent. And in terms of accuracy, precision, recall, and F1 score, accuracy is actually a major retreat, uh, metric for um, judging the model's um, accuracy. And finally, we are looking at the model performance. Okay, Deep learning is actually on the lead, CNN plus. Um, LSTM is actually one of the highest hybrid techniques that can actually be used for um, sentiment classifier on this day. So finally, we are looking at building a classifier that can actually um, detect um, inverted complements from a hate speech. Okay, saying that Tijani is a bad guy at online presentation, in that context, it is not a hate speech. So such words can actually be moved from that hate speech classifier to a sentiment classifier for further processing. And this is the current work we are on right now. We, actually, we have actually forwarded this, our work to the uh, International Conference on Australian Intelligence and Data Mining in London, and it has actually been accepted for presentation come May this year. In conclusion, we've been able to identify these theory um, domains Successfully in cyber security, the medical diagnosis, and the social media network. All suggestions and future um, research work are noted. I'm being hopeful here yeah, that from these three domains will impact positively in the research community and the industry at large. Special thanks to God Almighty, to my family, to my home university for nominating me, to Tedford Nigeria. Or the sponsorship despite the rents of life in um, Maryland, to Morgan State University for accepting me despite the COVID-19 pandemic, and to Professor Hakim Tijani, the, the coordinator for the partnership between Ted for Nigeria and Morgan State University, to my chair, Professor Paul Wang, the chair of the Department of Computer Science. Finally, to my host and mentor, the man with a big heart, a wonderful personality, Dr. Mamudo. Um, Raman, Associate Professor of Computer Science, with special interest in computer vision, image processing, information retrieval, machine learning, deep learning, and data mining. Thank you so much for being my host. I'll rest my case here. Thank you so very much. God bless you all. Thank you. thank you. Thank you very much for combining a kind of three-in-one uh, presentation. I think uh, what I am able to to, to learn. Uh, you can stop sharing, please. Is okay. uh, the the fact that stem stem and I repeat stem cannot survive without a non stem. There is you have uh, validated that idea, that belief, that philosophy that uh, there is that marrying well, and there must be a marrying well between machines and human beings 
simply put, between STEM-related disciplines and the non-STEM humanities. Uh, we want to thank you most sincerely for sharing this important research work and for also providing learning opportunities for all of us. I have learned. Uh, we will modify in a little bit because of time. Uh, unfortunately, the first person, the pioneers go through a lot, but at the same time, they do also have some latitude that uh, somebody coming thereafter may not have. <laughs> so he has eight upon uh, Dr. Ipano's time and our time generally, but he has not done that in vain. He has really, really showcased his standard, uh, which we, we have I could see Infinis Smart raising up his or her hand. I will not allow you to ask questions why, because I've told all of us to please rename yourself so that we know who is who behind the veil. Okay, behind the veil is somebody, is a human being. So you need to rename yourself. And all questions should be saved till the end of the second presentation, which will be 30 uh, minutes. Don't eat up our time. Also important is the fact that uh, we started with 110. Now the participant is reading 141, 141. But I know we more than that because in some video I could see three, four, five uh, people uh, sharing. Uh, it's good. It's also an indication that uh, we are, you know, worshiping. Uh, or washing, excuse me, washing uh, soccer, <laughs> you know, kind of, uh, I thank you. But let me, before I bring in Dr. Ipano, and then we ask questions, let me uh, quickly uh, appreciate people that have joined us, you know, some of our uh, colleagues, senior colleagues, I've mentioned a few of them, but it will not be uh, out of place to also identify those that join us or that I identify shortly after the first presenter started. I want to thank uh, Professor Ogun Dawole. Ogun Dawole, just pardon me. Uh, thank you, he's correct. You know? it's correct. Yeah. Correct. Thank you for joining us, sir. You can uh, thank mute. You. Uh, but uh, also important in our midst is the Vice President for Information Technology and the uh, Chief Information Officer for Morgan State University, Professor Adebisi Oladipupo. We, we thank you most sincerely, and I, I will yield the floor to you, sir, uh, as I am uh, AVP Astaki and uh, VP Zell. Uh, you are also representing the, the Thank president. you, Professor. Professor Ibikole Tijani. Um, I'm really honored to be able to join and hear excellent, excellent presentation. I know there are more to come. Sorry I came late, so pardon me for my tardiness. I had to juggle two meetings like everybody does. And because I won't be here for long either, I will look forward to some of the copies of the presentation down the road. But I just want to say quickly, the presentation that I just listened to is very rich and really, really commendable. And I'm hoping down the road I'll get to meet the presenter because at these three of the areas are my area of interest. I won't say expertise, but interest. Python programming, cyber security, uh, <laughs> basically mobile app development because you mentioned about using mobile and web application for the second part of your presentation. So in any way in which we can be partners, and I emphasize partner, I'm here to assist to the extent possible. But I want to thank everyone on this call. Keep doing the right thing. And as we say, Morgan, keep moving forward. Keep moving forward. Thank you so much for the time. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Oladi Pupo is a professor of uh, engineering. Check him on, uh, I believe, the fifth floor of Tyler Hall uh, to continue the partnership. I should also acknowledge uh, Professor Peng and Professor Shane 
Dr. Neti, uh, Professor Bista, if you are available, the three people I've just mentioned to say a few words. Uh, and then also appreciate Professor Adegbite, the Dean of uh, Faculty of Arts at Adelike University, uh, the first institution in, uh, in Nigeria that we signed an MOU and the first place where President Wilson gave the first commencement and also uh, set up uh, a, a mini scholarship uh, for for some of the graduating needy uh, students. Thank you. If, if you are here, the following people, uh, Professor Bista, uh, Peng, Shane, Dr. Nighty, just 10 seconds, 20 seconds. If they are not- Thank then you. Okay, go Thank ahead. you, Professor Tejani, uh, and then wonderful colleagues in the room. It's just so nice to see all of you and Thank you so much for considering Morgan State University for your professional uh, networking growth um, and then scholarship. Uh, very proud and happy to welcome each of you. Um, with Dr. Tejani and other colleagues, I've been doing a, a number of international initiatives. I am hosting um, the research and scholarship webinar series uh, this semester and the next semester. So I invite you um, to those sessions and come and listen and then share your experience uh, and hopefully we can do some collaborative book projects or journal articles. Um, I do have two sessions every month um, and I will be sending the additional information to Dr. Tijani so you can get those dates and times. Um, also we do have a few book projects and projects coming out and this month is very special in our Black History Month and we have two special sessions looking into HBCUs and their international uh, programs and initiatives, more focusing on internationalization of uh, HBCUs. Um, so I look forward to working with you and uh, thank you again for, for this wonderful session. Thank you very much, Dr. Bista. Thank you very much. And I, I believe if not all of us would be delighted that they have the opportunity to to publish in your multidisciplinary uh, uh, outfit. Uh, of course, you are not paying. Like I've always said, you don't pay for your intellectual property, and you can see the validation. I've also seen uh, Dr. Dibwa, uh, professor of history and geography uh, at Northern State University, joining us. Uh, if I miss out anybody, please. Um, well, I've seen also Dr. Rosemary Igbo, Director of uh, International Students uh, Office in the division. So all these people, if you would like to say just 10 seconds, uh, maybe Professor Dibwa will wait until uh, Dr. Ipano, because he is also hosting Dr. Ipano and mentoring him uh, while he's here with us as a postdoc. Is Dr. Shane with us, still with us? Yeah, yeah, I... Uh, Go ahead. Okay, yeah, I heard you mention my name. Uh, this is Dr. Guangmin Chen from engineering. And uh, we have uh, several Ted Fund fellow coming this semester. Actually, they have already been a doctoral student in our department uh, last semester. And uh, we also have uh, one Ted Fund doctoral student who came in about two years ago. That doctor student is doing an excellent job. So, mm -hmm. and uh, um, now the we have a the several Ted Fung uh, fellow um, already attend Morgan since the last semester, and uh, two of them just got into the country this semester. And uh, because the COVID status, so international travel is definitely a challenge to all of us. And uh, there's uh, several students will be still coming uh, later this semester. I hope everything will be fine to them for their international travel. Uh, so welcome. Uh, I just want to, on behalf of engineering school and uh, our department, industrial and system engineering department, to welcome all the Tech Fund students to Morgan for your graduate study. 
or for your postdoctoral research. Um, and uh, at this time, you may not be able to see a lot of faculty on campus, but as long as the uh, virus is clear, you're going to see all the faculty and the professor, uh, graduate student, they will be working hard on campus later on, I hope uh, later this year. No, sir. Yeah. Okay, and uh, I hope uh, later this year the, uh, the COVID-19 can be clear. Um, and uh, then we can have a good uh, uh, research environment uh, later this year and uh, also for next year. Okay. Uh, income, uh, anyway, welcome to Morgan State University. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Dr. Shane. Uh, I believe Dr. Peng, Dr. Dibua, Dr. Naiti, Dr. Rosemary Igbo, and uh, Dr. Adebite, if you like to say, please keep it to five seconds so that we can move on to the next paper. Five seconds means that, I mean, I can only mention my name, right? <laughs> yeah. um, I'm uh, Bob Netty, um, and um, a Happy New Year to uh, everyone, uh, although it's a bit into the year already. Um, and thanks to uh, Dr. Otumu for his presentation. I just remembered uh, someone was helping me um, uh, just a few years back, um, trying to mimic the, what the immune system does in the human body uh, um, and, and try to fashion it around uh, computerization. So, uh, you know, with, with your presentation on uh, the uh, Lasse fever, um, I worked on it a little bit. Uh, I had a cousin who worked on it in, uh, in Liberia as well. Um, so, I mean, it's very interesting how uh, this whole uh, phenomenon is being shaped uh, to mimic uh, the human body. My background is in medicine. Of course, I'm an infectious disease doctor. Um, so uh, it's, it's very interesting for me uh, that uh, um, such presentation, uh, you know, veered in that direction. But on be I welcome all of you uh, to the United States on behalf of uh, the Division of International Affairs. I work with Dr. Um, Tijani. And uh, of course, I mean, most of the scholars, not most, all of you have met me already because I had to val validate your, your, your presence in this uh, country. Um, and moving forward, uh, I'm glad that you are here to pave the way for the, the uh, subsequent cohort that are going to be coming after you. So this is very interesting. Um, you know, you take this, uh, I hope um, that your experience here is very um, welcoming and uh, you would um, uh, paint a very good um, uh, story for us um, in Nigeria when you go back uh, for the next cohort that will be visited. So I welcome you all back um, at some time in the future as well as visiting professors, like young professors. You never know where this <laughs> whole program is going to end up. So I welcome you all. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nati. Thank you so much. And uh, we also thank the uh, AD4 TV and radio in Abuja for staying with us and uh, broadcasting live across West Africa. We thank you, Dr. Alada. Uh, if, if you are here, if you want to say, we appreciate it. Because the training of that MOU in 2020, uh, you happen to be one of the the back end, and you continue to to assist uh, my office, the Global Partnerships uh, Africa, in uh, concretizing signature agreements. You know, making it happen. Thank you. Okay, do I have, uh, I believe, Dr. Dibwa, you want to speak or you want to just go down? Okay, you, you are muted. Okay, sir, go ahead, sir. Dr. Dibwa is one of our teachers. I actually wanted to wait until uh, after... Okay, sir. Listening to your... Okay, okay, sir. I just quickly say that uh, for Dr. Otumo, his presentation actually hit home because I was teaching at Ekoma when Nasa Fever was a major team. And unfortunately, one of my little niece, who actually was a student here, 
died of plaza fever. So I know how significant it is in terms of the research you are doing. So hopefully um, there will be more done in terms of using various means, various means to combat um, the disease. Well, like I said, I'll wait until after Dr. Bana. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much. Um, Professor Adebite, Dean of Faculty of Arts, Adeleke. Uh, it's been a wonderful session. The Morgan team for putting this together has been quite uh, enlightening and revealing. Even though it's not my field, but at least I've been able to learn one or two things from the presentations today. So I thank Morgan State for doing this. Thank you, sir. We look forward to seeing you guys uh, in summer or study abroad. Yes, right? sure. We'll be expecting you and your team, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, at this point, let me. Uh, I don't think Dr. Dr. Shane, are you there? If he's not there, let me go ahead and introduce Dr. Ipano, who will be speaking to us for another 30 minutes, and then we can ask questions and then wrap it up. I'm trying to bring up. Uh, well, Dr. Elijah Ipano is uh, a lecturer in the Department of History, Benway State University, and a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of History, Geography, and Museum Studies at Morgan State University. Uh, Dr. Opano has published widely, and uh, he will be uh, speaking to us about headsmen, security, and the rural economy in uh, TV land. TV land is uh, uh, a place in Nigeria and it will explain the geographical you know, uh, domain and tell us. But there's something about this paper or this presentation also uh, that kind of validates the idea of marrying well, the machine that is the STEM folks and humanities generally. I'll be looking forward to a collaboration between Ipano and Otumo in terms of combating security in Africa generally, or starting with Nigeria, where they are primarily based. So Dr. Elijah, you are co-host. You have 30 minutes to kindly share your slide if you have one, and I know you have it. Uh, by the way, I'll be sharing the bo uh, both slides, that is a PowerPoint, with all of you, as well as the audio and video recording of this meeting. Thank you very much. Dr. Ipano, you have the floor, sir. Yeah, thank you. Good morning. While waiting on Dr. Ipano, Ms. Igbo, you will uh, speak if you're still with us uh, after his presentation, please. Just a few words or questions or comment. The infinite smart person should please rename himself or herself so that we can give you the platform to ask your comment i mean to ask your question or comment and for others always sign in or you rename yourself in environment such as uh, this dr tijani while waiting the technical uh aspect may i make a one announcement please do sir please do um at morgan we have been collecting the you know, educational uh, experiences of our faculty and postdocs. Mm -hmm. um, so if you are interested to share your cross-cultural experience, um, you know, working um, and, you know, presenting research or travel, any of those things, um, you know, we do have upcoming opportunities to write short essays, essays about 1500 words uh, in one of our special books that features Morgan faculty, student, and postdocs. Um, I will be sending you the uh, guidelines and templates, and uh, those things. Um, you know, the, your essays, uh, experiences would be greatly appreciated. Over to you, Professor Tijani. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bista. And uh, for those of you interested, uh, you can check out Dr. Bista on LinkedIn and become his friend. If you are not my friend, befriend me first. And uh, before you befriend Dr. Bista, and then you can always, that's a joke, but it, it, it goes a long way. 
that's another opportunity for us to to flower and harvest this continued relationship. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Ipano, you have the floor and uh, make it a slide show. I show you, Aki. We can see you now. If I tell you, we'll just continue. continue. Um, good morning uh, for people in the US and Canada. Good morning. Good, uh, good evening for people in Nigeria and the rest of Africa. I'm looking at Hesman attacks, displacements, and effects on periodic markets and rural development in Thief land. Um, we are going to look at discussion points. First of all, I'll give a background to where Thief land is. We'll look at concepts and theories that are involved in the study of markets, periodic markets, where we'll look at uh, periodic markets and the economy in the pre-colonial, colonial, and post-colonial tip area. We will look at displacements and what has made those markets to be deserted. We will look at herdsmen attacks, displacements, and dislocation of the rural economy. So the tip area, given the background, um, Thief people are basically found in Taraba State, Nasarawa State, Plateau State, Adamawa State, and Kaduna State, but predominantly they occupy Benue State largely, where they have the majority. So we are delimiting our study to Benue State, where most of these attacks have taken place. And also in Benue State, we are not looking at the entire Benue State because it is not all the areas in Benue State that are affected. Even in TIF, uh, 12 local governments, it's not all the local governments that are affected. And also, for local governments that are affected, not all local governments that are affected in terms of effect on uh, rural economy. So we we will look at the northern thief area. Basically, we look at uh, the four local governments in this part of thief land. Suffice to say that this research is an ongoing research. It's just part of the entire research that I am conducting at Morgan. Uh, I'm looking at conflicts in central Nigeria. I'm also limiting it to Benue State. So we're looking at land conflicts, land resource-based conflicts, and this is just part of what we are looking at. So I'll be, it's a research in progress, so it's good that I make that known at this stage. This is the area that we are looking at. This area borders basically Nasarawa State in northern Thief land. So we took a look at conceptual and theoretical context in this discussion. And before I proceed, I wish to also make this very point known at this beginning. We are very careful about ethnic profiling. So we are not saying that the Fulani ethnic group is attacking the Benue farming communities, but we are also looking at just herdsmen and herdsmen militia. Those are the groups that we are looking at in terms of this discussion. And herdsmen, Fulani herdsmen, um, or Fulani pastoralists are nomadic or semi-nomadic people uh, whose primary occupation is raising livestock. We have had very good relationship with the Fulani pastoralists. Some of them have settled in deep land in the Benue communities right from when even I was a kid. We, we, we had to buy Nunu from them. Sometimes they would dash us Nunu. We never had problems until 
um, mid 20, 2000, and then from there, from 2012 to 2022 now, the relationship has changed into a more violent relationship. And globally, this is also a problem that has generated global attention. So Global Terrorism Index recently placed the flat, the Nigeria's Fulani Hezmer as the world's fourth deadliest militant group for having accounted for about 1,229 deaths in 2014. Amnesty International also, uh, through a published work in New Telegraph, January 29, 2018, asserted that Fulani Hezmer had killed 168 people in January alone, and that was the height of it that generated global attention when people were killed on the 1st of January 2018 in their sleep. So we're looking at displacements. How have these attacks caused displacements? And for us to understand that, we understand what displacements, displacements are and the magnitude to which they, they have occurred. Ido, in his research, um, submitted that violence between husband and farmers has displaced more than 100,000 people in Benue State. But FEMA, FEMA, sorry, the Benue State Management Emergency Management Agency uh, reported that these attacks have actually displaced not fewer than 600,000 residents across the states. And that is the situation as it is in Benue State. So, um, like I said, we had very good relationship with Hezmen in the past, but this relationship changed because of uh, some factors. Some reasons being that the climate change has put more pressure on the fertile land uh, for, for, for the people of Benue State. The land is very fertile. We have had conspiracy theories define the land in their own context, how the land is very fertile, the grass is very nutritious. And there are also some thoughts that because the land is very fertile and the um, grass is very nutritious, there has been deliberate attempts to displace the people and take over the land. This is also another uh, argument to, 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 to the crisis. And you can also see that previously we had um, herdsmen who carry sticks, but now we have herdsmen who carry uh, guns in protection of their, their cattle and also in search for, for grass. Here, too, there has been other um, arguments to these reasons. Scholars, some scholars have argued that through their findings, it is the point of the herdsmen that it is because their cattle sometimes get rustled. That's the most reason why they have to protect themselves with the sophisticated weapons that they have. That is also another point of discussion, a point of note. But generally, if you look at the picture uh, on the right, you see how this um, change in what the herdsmen used in protecting and guiding their cattle has led to. Because of these sophisticated weapons, they now come to communities, displace communities, keep people, and take control of those areas and then sometimes they even occupy them so you will see that people have actually been displaced you will see in these pictures where people move from the rural areas with their, 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 their belongings on their heads some of them will settle at um, junctions to get vehicles where they could sleep to, to, to the urban areas. 
all these are caused by the Esmen attacks. So because this research is not um, just to look at um, activities of Esmen attacks and causes and the rest, but to look at how those displacements, the attacks and displacements have affected the rural economy. And because I is a postdoc research, a follow-up from my PhD thesis, which I did on periodic markets, we looked at how these markets regulated rural economy, intensified exchange at the rural areas, linking rural communities with urban centers and the national economy. So we'll look at what these periodic markets are. Periodic markets are studied across the globe, in Asia, in Russia, in Europe. Uh, so many countries have developed from these rural markets. They have also received attention from different scholars. Hill, Hoda, and Juan Mali have all descri described periodic markets in different ways. But there is that general agreement on the concept of periodic markets, that it is an authorized public gathering of buyers and sellers of commodities meeting at an approved place and at a regular interval. So you have concepts that also link these markets and their functionality. You have frequency, market frequency, periodicity, rings or cycles or market cycles. You have market centers and market areas. When you discuss about frequency of these markets, you are talking about how these markets occur within a particular period of time, like maybe for one month, how many times do they appear? For one year, how many times do they appear? And in five years, how many times do they um, appear in terms of um, functionality, in terms of operation? How many times people attend them in, in exchange of goods and services? And if you talk about market cycles, which I'm going to show us another slide here shortly. Market cycles, you have these, this diagram here. You have markets operating in five days um, uh, cycle. And between this market here and this one, this one operates, maybe it operates today being Wednesday, this one operates tomorrow being Thursday. And between this market and this one, there is an interval here. This is the interval that is referred to as market cycles. Whatever happens here is also as a result of trade activities. I just went to that slide to explain what market cycles are, what frequency is. So the market area, the market center is that particular spot where uh, trade activities take place and other activities take place. But when you are talking about market area, you are talking about those adjoining markets servicing a particular place in a particular region. That is what market um, area is. And particularly for thief markets, uh, an archaeologist did a very uh, early research on thief markets, and collaborated researches that were done by Paul and Laura Bohanan, the, the colonial anthropologist who studied the markets in thief land. But the thief archaeologist um, A.D. Gigi argued that thief markets are clearly designated arenas that functioned not merely as centers for buying and selling, but also doubled as veritable institutions for social celebrations and commemoration of all that accelerated the tempo of economic activity. So he also aligned with that definition that was given by Hill, Hodder, and Wamali. So looking at the theories that define periodic markets, I will not waste so much time on that, but these are arguments that try to discuss markets as indigenous economic institutions. So you have Hodder, Bromley, forwarding endogenous theory. 
that says that all these markets originated from uh, the internal societies, from activities within the societies. And A.G. Hopkins also supported that argument that it was as a result of local demands for goods and services that people try to um, um, create avenues through which they um, exchange their goods and services. But people like uh, Weber, Walani, they argue that the market did not originate from traditional African societies because they did not have that sense of uh, exchange until they had contact with the Europeans. So um, the central place theory, this is where we are going to form the background for our, our, our discussion on displacements. The central place theory was not directly developed to discuss periodic markets, but what our Chris, Christella dis, dis, uh, uh, discussed um, hierarchical organization of societies in terms of geography, geography, in terms of special distribution of settlements from villages to town to cities, trying to look at how uh, people have serviced those communities, those cities and those towns. But scholars of periodic markets adopted this central place theory to discuss periodic markets. And if you look at this diagram, the central place theory diagram here on the right, and you compare it with what we have on the left here that are developed for chief markets, you will see some spots that are green these spots that are green are supposed to be small or smaller markets that we call minor markets. The ones in blue are the medium markets. So these medium markets are those that those small or minor markets are. So they are they are they are, they are arranged in, in hierarchy. That is what they call hierarchical arrangement of periodic markets. It's ordered is authorized so these blue uh, spots are also serving the yellow spots which is another stage or another level or size of a market and after that you have these are all marketplaces so you have a market area this red spot shows you how all these smaller markets or minor markets with medium markets now serve that central place. So the collection of goods begins from those smaller markets to medium markets and culminates into the larger markets. And in the chief area, for instance, you have those rural markets that some even operate in the evening. They serve the regional markets at district level. And those markets at district levels now serve the markets that are also serving as local government headquarters. So anything that affects those smaller markets affect the intermediate markets and also affects the markets at the local government headquarters. And that is the situation we have found in, in Benue State, for instance. So we... We went ahead to look at the trajectory of periodic markets in the tip area over time. And we began with these markets that operated right from the pre-colonial period. They were very important and very significant in the distribution of both indigenously produced goods and external goods that got into the tip area. So you had markets that were considered as regional markets. Those are the border areas that served the internal markets in the hinterlands. And they also facilitated intergroup relations in the pre-colonial period. And the colonial government also found these markets very, very interesting and very important in revenue generation. Not only revenue generation, but also in buying and bulking uh, commodities for evacuation to the coastal areas. So, Tra European trading firms were deliberately or in, in creating or establishing periodic markets where they did not exist. And besides that, 
the these markets were encouraged to be established because they helped the colonial economy in generating revenue through taxes so people that were charged with that responsibility were the um traditional rulers the traditional institution that was also created by the colonial government and the post-colonial government has also found this periodic market very very significant because they help in revenue generation market use market fines and all those other parts of produce control fines on produce or revenue on produce are generated at this market so the government does not um take this market and the importance very lightly but these markets have been also affected by these displacements the attacks and displacements of um the farming communities in the rural areas so i'm going to um, give us a short video to look at the activities of these markets how they operated and you can look at the items i don't know if you are looking at the video these are the kind of activities that happened at these markets you can see the, the mm -hmm. items the commodities for sale this is the nature of markets that we have mm -hmm. in open places. Mm -hmm. these are these, these are the commodities you have yam you have foreign goods that are here you see people in the open market area and then you have shops that are also uh, stores that are selling european goods this is the nature of markets that we have in the northern tv land and other parts this is the intermediate markets and this is the central place is a market for local government headquarters that serves the local government councils. So I'll quickly also go to the second video here that so So these are markets that are attacked. If you look at this video, you will see that these markets, people have left these markets carrying their items on their head. These are markets that are attacked. This is Bajimba market in Northern Tivland. You look at what is left at these markets. So we will move to the next um, discussion. I have done some field work, and like I said, it's a research in progress, but I have gotten so far data on the kind of losses that we have at the, at the rural areas as a result of these attacks and displacements. There, there is an estimation that about 2,745 um, people were killed. And from these 2,745, we had about 1,773 people that were killed at these market settlements, these market areas. And this data is generated from State Emergency Management Agency in Benway State. We are trying to see how so it's going to be difficult, but we're trying to see how we can get um, people, families, give us some number of people that they have also lost. Though it's not easy because most of these people now have moved to uh, IDP camps. Some of them have even left to cities where they are staying with their relations. We have also gathered that about um, several stores at these markets, like we saw destruction of buildings there. 
So those buildings, numbering about 3,000 trucks, have been destroyed between 2018 and 2021. And people stored grains, such as soya beans, rice, sesame seed, melon, granite, guinea corn, maize. And the people, uh, from the estimation we got, that since 2015, they have lost about 874 million naira across the three local government areas. And government has also lost uh, revenue generation because these markets are no longer in existence. People have left them. There is nothing happening there. People no longer go to the farm. And at these markets, because most of them served the smaller markets, they were um, uh, central places, facilitating other activities. And around these markets, there were also public and private schools. People's investments in those private schools also collapsed. And we had about 375 markets, um, uh, uh, schools, sorry, both public and private schools destroyed and deserted. Government has also claimed to have lost about one billion naira in revenue on market fines and dues and produce since 2018. And public hospitals and private hospitals that were operated at these places have also uh, been destroyed, numbering to about 281 uh, public and private hospitals. No farming activities have taken place at these places in 2016. People have left their communities and those markets have also uh, been abandoned. We are trying to look at how um, we can find a solution and make some recommendations. But because this is a research in progress, some thoughts and some findings that I'm getting uh, in the field are also not uh, findings that we can say are conclusive because we are saying if there are attacks on the farming communities as a result of their settlement pattern where there is partial distribution of houses because being a farming community people prefer to have their houses around their their farms so we are trying to see can they move people from these places to a more centralized place where security will be provided and then where um, also um, um, schools and um, hospitals, churches can be concentrated. And people can only stay here and go to the farm. But there are also arguments that because of cultural and historical background of these people, they will not be able to abandon their own ancestral homes because they have that attachment to their ancestral homes. So trying to say somebody should leave his own that he, he holds dear to her to come and, come and settle somewhere and be just going to the farm and coming back is going to be difficult. But we are trying to see how uh, we can make some, 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 some findings from the, from the field, looking at what people will say that will benefit them and not something that can be brought to the people. They should be able to decide the kind of settlement pattern and the kind of security that will will best, best suit for, for their existence. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a research in progress. We hope that in our next presentation, we will now marry the issue of land uh, resource control and the issue of herdsmen and other uh, causes of these conflicts in, in Benue State and Tivland particularly. I wish to, at this point, thank my host, Professor Jeremiah Deboa, for his assistance, for his uh, amiable hospitality. He has made everything very possible for me to keep the ground running. I also wish to thank Professor uh, Tijani for his fatherly rule, right from Nigeria to the US and Morgan. Uh, there is no time I have ran to him that I didn't get any uh, help in terms of my research. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
Dr. Ekpano, and that you can clear your screen, stop sharing. Uh, Gaba Adamo raise up his hand. You will also go after Dr. Debo. Uh, the first thing I, I want to say is that um, you may want to reconsider as you research the title of your paper and then uh, title because I see you extending or being specific or doing a micro study dr Ipano, you're trying to uh, do a micro study of crisis of development and when i say crisis of development i'm borrowing the idea of professor Dibu in his celebrated work on crisis of modernization and development in africa so what you have presented and i think what you are trying to do uh, should not be an advocacy Objectivity is the hallmark of historical scholarship. It should never be an advocacy. You must be able to separate yourself as an indigenous of Benue state from the issues at hand. Also important is the periodization. History is about period. Uh, your attempt to weave the pre-colonial, colonial, which was largely absent except for the, uh, the concept and theories that you identify. And then the current situation that is actually the focus of your paper uh, makes it rather uh, wild. And for the non-traditional historians, they may try to grapple. So you may look into that uh, uh, as you revise and you continue your work. It is important beyond stating that you should get hold of Dubois' work, particularly the crisis of development, to also look at Ogundeji, Gabriel Ogundeji's work on pre-industrial economy in northern Nigeria. Very, very central, particularly when you're talking about markets and then you're looking at the decolonization of Eurocentric view about markets and marketplaces in the economy of various, you know, uh, towns in Nigeria. There is something that I want you to uh, to connect for us. Uh, I, I, I was looking at diasporic relationships, the influence of those TV people origin, uh, Benue origin, connecting that triadic relationship between those in Benue state or the local government that you have identified as your focus and the TV men and women in the diaspora, whether in Europe, in the Americas, or whatever. Lastly, you mentioned that uh, traditional rulers created by colonial government and I put it down you know and uh, you may check the, the video or audio later uh, I don't know whether that was a slip of tongue or you meant something else or indeed there is or there was the creation of warrant chiefs in this part of Nigeria we popularly talk about warrant chiefs in the eastern part and of course late active <laughs> To, you know, work on warrant chiefs. Okay, uh, were there warrant chiefs? Again, if you are looking at colonial period, I think is a big, important statement that will validate or invalidate what is happening now in terms of contemporary history. Again, I want to thank you on behalf of. Uh, Global Partnerships Office and indeed Morgan uh, for sharing with us your your research. Uh, it's been so illuminating, uh, educating, and uh, for me, I have learned again, just as we did with uh, Dr. Ochumo. I'll yield the floor to Professor Dibua to speak 
and then um, those people with their hands up you don't have to unmute yourself please don't unmute yourself you speak after others have spoken uh, professor Dibwa, thank you yeah uh, thank you professor Tijani, and thank you dr ipano for your illuminating, illuminating presentation um at least it talks to a lot of the issues that are happening in nigeria right now and i also should mention here at least in response to some of the points made by Tijani that um, myself and the um, the panel we have discussed this work and he decided to present this particular paper to be faithful to the research proposal he wrote when he was coming here of course like we know scholarship is dynamic and it expands and since he came we have discussed and like you mentioned this now actually becomes just a part at most a chapter of his work he has now is now looking broadly at conflicts in that part of the country and in terms of internal conflicts and also conflicts between team and their neighbors and so um hopefully during the history day that might be in april this year i've already arranged that uh, dr ipana will present an update on his research and so he will incorporate work that he has done here at morgan but I, I haven't said that. I mean, the paper he presented still talks a lot and speaks to what is an important issue in Nigeria today, the crisis between headsmen and farmers. And we know that this spreads all over the country, not just in the TV area. So I thank um, Dr. Pano and you, uh, Dr. Tijani, for your contributions. And uh, at this point, I also need to thank Tedford for the cooperation in our department, we have two doctoral students in their second year now who are here under the auspices of Ted, of Ted Fund. Of course, we have Dr. Ekmano. And I think I also might need to make an appeal here because um, in Nigeria, we tend to emphasize science and technology. And I'm hearing through the grapevine that Ted Fund is about to focus on science and technology. If that is the case, I'm saying that that would be a grave error. Because like was mentioned, no society can develop just based on science and technology alone. And it will also be unfair to deprive those in the humanities and social sciences of what they will gain in terms of collaborating abroad. So in a short way, I'm just saying that I hope that the third fund initiative for both the postdoc candidates and the doctoral candidates will remain and be extended to all as humanities, education, social sciences, and of course the sciences. Again, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Debois. And uh, I, you can trust me, I'm, I'm in support. I've always been fighting that battle and uh, we continue to and uh, we will take you know uh, this message to the es as well as the chairman of the board of uh ted fund they are mostly political and academics but again we cannot you know say it better than the way we've been saying it but we must engage in serious advocacy uh continent-wide that STEM is not is incomplete without the non-STEM. It is absolutely incomplete. We have funds, grants in uh, at the University of London, for instance, in the history of medicine. And then you have a validation by Dr. Tumo presenting, and you can see how AL machines is working well with human. What sense does it make when you develop an app? to combat or dissect medical issues without understanding the culture. And I know that by the time Dr. Ricky Amaman is presenting our paper or our work, working with Dr. Neti, working with Dr. Alex Jackson, and then Dr. Ngam, the Dean of Liberal, you'll see a combination, a fine combination of 
marrying well the stem and the non-stem. Uh, we will continue to, to, to fight the battle, sir. Uh, we will yield the floor, this virtual floor, to the following in this order. And you have uh, 10, 15 seconds. Do not represent the paper, please. Uh, Garba mm -hmm. Adamu. Yeah, okay. go ahead. Followed by Adek Benro, Dr. Adek Benro. And then followed by uh, Maize. And then followed by Adeola Adebadi. Do not unmute until you are, it's your turn. And then lastly, oh. Okay, the number is growing now. Uh, we will have Dr. Gundikwe and then uh, the last will, will be Dr. Rukia Maman Simpson. Thank you. 10 seconds. Go ahead, Dr. Adam. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Jenny, the outdoor uh, program, and also the center of the uh, There's one observation I want to make. I like the way the presenter talk about uh, the historical occurrence of this uh, violence. It's probably from 2012 to 2015. Can you hear me? Hello? Yeah, we can. Go ahead. Go ahead, please. I know you are driving. Just make it short. Oh, from 2012 to 2014. I'm before then they used to be with the Islamic Hassan and uh, we all know it here in Southern Nigeria that relationship between Fulani Hassan and farmers in Nigeria has been very cordial throughout the century. Of recent, we are yet to know what are the major food of the tribe and the paper has not uh, well on that too. Secondly, uh, being an academic with a teacher, I expect to see that balance is uh, presentation as he talks largely on his tribesmen uh, fight, but he has not in any way spoken about the uh, side of Fulani, who incidentally are uh, his uh, playmate. I'm sure uh, all Africans listen to uh, that kind about slave with Fulani and uh, farmers. So I expect the speaker to speak about the side, the side of Fulani uh, has uh, regarding the side but uh, lively well on uh, uh, thank, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Dijen. Thank you, thank you, sir. Also, thank you very much. Thank you. Next, Dr. Adegbenro. Adura Agbemi, sorry. Adura Agbenro. Dr. Ekwano just note, and then Dr. Tumu note, uh, you guys will speak thereafter. Dr. Agbenro, please. Adura Agbenro, excuse me. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir. And I really want to appreciate God and appreciate you for all the organization. Please, in the spirit of the goal of the program, is an opportunity to also collaborate. I will appreciate if um, Dr. Tumu could please provide his email address. My colleagues will understand that with what we are treating now about data analytics and um, machine learning, we really will have a lot to learn from him. Thank you very much. It was really a wonderful presentation. We've yes. learned a lot. Thank you. And man. can this also be used on COVID, substance, drug, I mean, use disorder? Let's know more. Thank you very much, sir. Continue the, the dialogue. We will share with you, Dr. Dr. Thomas. Uh, uh, if you are spoken, please put down your hand, lower your hand. Next is, uh, did I call Amazing? Amazing before? Okay, please continue. Amaze. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, Professor Tijani, the Morgan State University group and the third point for this platform. Uh, listen uh, carefully to all the presentations, but the one that struck me most, uh, especially from my angle as an environmental psychologist, 
is uh, that of uh, Dr. Ojumu. Uh, I have two questions. The first one is, uh, of course, during his presentation, he talked about uh, accuracy of his own uh, model of detecting uh, Fuji websites. Uh, my, my question is this, is it possible for the uh, model he designed to pick up legitimate websites as illegitimate one? How often does this occur? And what are the kinds of things that can cause a legitimate website to be seen as, an, as a fishy one? You know, uh, such things will need to be brought out in order to help maybe website developers and all that to ensure that their legitimate sites are not, uh, I mean, quashed by this website, uh, by this model. Yeah. The Thank, second you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Maize. We are, you know, uh, beyond our time is uh, 12.03. I will like us to wrap up by 12.15. Others still have questions. You can privately send those uh, Others talk to us, Dr. Amaize. Uh, I'll take okay. Dr. Ade, Ade Bajo uh, Adeolas. Uh, please make it so snappy. Uh, Professor Wundo Wale, uh, I can see your hands up, sir. Uh, you will speak last after Dr. Olu Wale. So we have Dr. Gundipe, Dr. Mama, uh, Bayogu, and uh, Dr. Uh, and, uh, Baba Ogundawali. Thank you. Quickly, Dr. Ogundipo. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Go ahead. Um, good evening, everyone. I so much appreciate this platform and, of course, the two presenters. Um, I have a kind of comment that will be directed to the last presenter who presented on the Hada first Amas conflict. Because that's my area. Initially, when he started his presentation, he said he did not target any ethnic group or ethnic profiling. So I want to I want him to correct the impression by saying that uh, the husband that are responsible for the social innocence, particularly in the uh, they are not solely full and there are some other ethnic uh, there are some other ethnic men like that who are responsible for the destruction not only full and ethnic thank then you very I will much also, yes do, lastly please let me quickly just mention this I would like him to interrogate the role of the community leaders community leaders in foiling this conflict because we cannot singly point uh, the the uh, the agents that the corporate the role of the community leader civilian judge task force should be should be investigated and lastly we should also look at the area of our government spaces how do our government spaces in north central particularly in venues to promote um, had a farmer's conflict. So this thank you very much, Dr. Uh, uh, I know you have a lot to ask. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Yes. Dr. Ikbano has uh, noted, and then you will engage for that. I'm also interested in that, too, uh, as, okay. as a specialist in that. Too. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Ogundipe, make it five thank seconds. Five seconds. Thank straight. My is on that. I noticed that when the president was talking, he narrowed down his discourse to Benue State. And I think um, a, a driving slogan of Benue State is the food basket of the nation. Probably he should mention that to, um, to, to make his work robust, telling us that Benue State is actually a food basket of the nation. Now the dwindling side of Benue State uh, as a food basket of the nation can further be discussed. Thank you very much. Sir. Thank you very much for that uh, information. I know that uh, Dr. Ipano uh, is aware of that and has been teaching that. Dr. Maman, please. Good afternoon, uh, Professor Tejani and everyone on the floor. I think I'm, I'll just, the last speaker, the lady before the other guy who spoke um, just before me, 
is uh, basically is what I wanted to talk about. So I think I kind of differ a bit from Professor Tejani and Dr. Ipano's host in the sense that all of this will not be a problem if it's very clear that he's talking from an interpretive school of thoughts and which um, distance him away from the objectivity that you like to see. And I think if we continue, if he continue on that school of thought as interpretivists, as someone like me too, I'm keen on those kind of critical standpoint, then all of this will be will be pulling. We know he's from Benway State. We know he's talking from his own uh, with talking from his own standpoint. And so anybody reading his research would have seen that disclaimer. So um, and the second one is to also talk about. Um, the first speaker, Dr. Otumu, and to address, to also appeal to all of us. You see, AI, artificial intelligence, is not a respecter of discipline. So the sooner we start to tear down this wall of different discipline and protecting our our specific um, uh, uh, knowledge space, the better for all of us. And I think um, it's a good start for us to actually start to look at not just transdisciplinary but interdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary. If we don't do it as expert, the artificial intelligence will soon take away the kind of expertise we think we have by safeguarding our own niche um, um, dis um, discipline. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank Dr. you very Dr. much. Very Ayogu, good. you have this uh, virtual floor. Thank you, sir, for having me. Uh, my question goes directly to Dr. Tumu, and I would like to know where his research is placed within the context of explainable AI. Because just like the uh, last speaker was saying, uh, one of the issues arising against AI nowadays is that of um, being shrouded in some sort of secrecy. We see AI working, people are so afraid. Uh, applying AI in medicine has really broken ground. His discoveries will go far if the black box is uh, a bit opened up such that the decisions can be explained in a manner that makes it transparent. That's just my kind of Thank you. Advice. Thank you very much, uh, Engineer Ayoku. Uh, we'll take the uh, uh, professor, where is he now? Professor, can you? I can't see the button. Okay. Is that okay. a window? Or... Okay. Yes. Uh, my question is uh, I'm a philosopher. Uh, my question is to Dr. Epano. He spoke about the attachment of the displaced people with their land. Yeah, uh, uh, that, which means he's talking about the uh, interaction between them and their ancestors. Now, how come the idea of whether they should move them away from their home and create another center when they already have their land. The question that should bother us is, since these people have been at independent uh, displays uh, camp for so long period, are they not just being detached uh, permanently from their ancestral uh, connection. I think that question of asking them which one do they would like to be new city or this is, is uncalled for. The government should make sure that they return them to their ancestral land and anyone occupy that place, those places illegally should be removed forcibly. Thank you very Possibly. much. Thank, Thank you. you, Prof. Thank you, sir. Uh, we, we look forward to hosting uh, the governor of uh, Benue State uh, in the near future. We're working on that. And I know this debate will continue uh, when he visits us. Uh, uh, architect of Oak Joseph, make it five seconds please. all right great one um mine is just to tell them elijah that is doing a great work um 
his use of uh, Walter Christiana's um, central place theory is excellent. However, he didn't expand so much on um, the. Oh, we lost him. Okay, uh, uh, go ahead and, uh, you know, Dr. Tumu, Dr. Ipano, just quick in uh, response to, to those comments and uh, so that we can close here. Dr. Otumu, you want to go first? Okay, thank you so much. I hope you can hear me all. Um, the first person said my email address. I'm going to find a way to send in my email address so I can get to you. And probably every, any other person can actually reach me via my email address for further discussion. I guess there is no time to run up in another two minutes. The second person said something about our uh, fishing accuracy. Like I did say, it's kind of high and it can actually detect both fishing and non fishing website based on our classification. Okay. And based on certain features we use, and um, it can also detect those things properly. And um, most other. Um, fishing um, detection techniques considered very few um, options or heuristics like just an URL at symbol and all that in building their fishing detection um, model. I think um, the third person said something about um, the, 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 the medical diagnosis I'm working on. I guess um, with my email with them too, we can also discuss further on that so that we can actually reveal some of the nitty gritty of what we have done so far. I will have to um, stop here so I can give um, Dr. Ipano time to take it his own before we wrap up this session. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Dr. Ipano, sir. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all the comments. Um, it appears I had the uh, most comments to attend to, but I'll try to be as snappy as possible when i when i have these comments like this i know that yes people are interested in the area of research um first of all i will react to uh, dr rekia and dr adebajo's uh, um, issues which also border on what prof said about objectivity um maybe and um, it, it's it's because of um, i've noted other that are raised, but this issue of profiling and objectivity, it appears maybe um, when I was laying the background to this discourse, it appears maybe there was a misunderstanding about what I said. But I said I didn't want to profile um, uh, Fulani as being militants or uh, terrorists. That was what I said. That, that also makes it clear that, yes, it's not about Fulani hence men that are attacking the farming communities only. There could be criminals also taking advantage of this situation. So I by by saying profiling, I meant I didn't want to focus on on, on Fulani by saying well Fulani are not very good people, they are attacking us, they are killing us. That was not what I meant. But I've noted all that you have said. Maybe in the it's just slight, so there are no much details here. But I've done a lot on that in my my my, my whole paper, and um, uh, about um, Dr. Ogundikwe, full basket is noted. Is is noted. It will enrich the work further and also engage it more in terms of collaboration. And um, um, Professor Ogunde Wale, if I'm right. The issue of uh, attachment to ancestral home and the rest. The, this, this, this is a problem that we have uh, across the country, in different parts of the country. So I was thinking that we, while we wait for government to also profile some solutions, we should also look at internal um, ways of resolving the, the crisis, if we can, even if it is temporarily. We can look at how we can solve the problem while waiting for the bigger solutions. People are talking about ranching, constitutional uh, issues are there. But while we wait, we should look at how we can secure these places. On government spaces, yes, I agree with you. Um, there are, I, 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 I said something about criminals taking advantage. On government spaces, 
very, very, very um, uh, interesting point because most of these places are are, are left uncultivated. Uh, so we also need to understand that and then try to see how, if we have uh, large farms and the rest, that will also mitigate the whole issue of encroachment. And But it, uh, again, we also need to understand that um, it, it, sometimes it's not about uh, farm land. It's about well, how do you explain a situation where people sleep and they are killed in their, in their sleep? These are issues that we also need to interrogate further. We also need to keep that at the back of our minds. It's not really about ungoverned spaces. Sometimes people get killed in their own uh, homes. So um, I, I think I've, 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 I've attempted okay. to respond to all this. It's, it's, it's an ongoing research. I've noted all that you have said. I will try to be ahead. There was also one issue that uh, Garba Adamu raised about uh, being one-sided. I'm not being one-sided, sir. What I did here was just to look at how these attacks and displacements have affected uh, rural economy. It's a whole lot of vast area that people are interrogating from different disciplines. Even historically, if you want to look at the causes of this event, you write more than 100 pages on just the causes. But I'm just trying to look at how, being an economic historian, I'm trying to see how this has dislocated rural economy and how it has also affected revenue generation for the state. But I'm not uh, in, in any way trying to be one-sided at all. I'm not. I, it's because of the focus of my work. I, I just micro-focused it to be able to bring out my own uh, perspective to my area of study. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I would like to thank each and every one of you, uh, most especially the presenters, uh, for bracing the trail. Uh, our next meeting will be in two weeks' time. It's the same ID, and uh, you just have to sign in. But please maintain the um, the protocol. On the 23rd of February, at the same hour, 10 a.m. Uh, U.S. Eastern Time, 4 p.m. Nigeria, uh, West Africa. Uh, we will be listening to Dr. Eze Remigos uh, speaking to us on effect of aspect ratios on COD removal efficiencies for cyanide inhibited water waste in aerobic systems. So those engaging in water issue either surface or underground uh, should also join us. Uh, the second paper on the 23rd will be presented by Dr. Abdullahi uh, Abdulatif, and the title of his paper is Determination of Persistent Organic Pollution in Roadside Soil by Microwave Assisted Solvent Extraction and High Performance Liquid Chromatography. Uh, again, I thank each and every one of you. I thank uh, both colleagues, students, and uh, each one of you for finding time to to learn as I have learned. Thank you so much and uh, stay blessed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Prof. Bye. Thank you, thank thank you very, very much. much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you, Prof. Prof, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, sir.